One of my favorite movies is The Delta Force. It's an older movie. American tourists are hijacked by Arab terrorists who hold the hostages in Beirut. Lee Marvin and Chuck Norris lead an elite team of US Special Forces that rescue the endangered travelers. At the beginning of the tragedy, the two Arab terrorists aboard the jetliner begin to separate the few Jews, Jewish tourists from the rest of the hostages. One of the most moving moments of the film is when Father William O'Malley, a priest from Chicago, played by George Kennedy, gets up from his seat and walks into the first class compartment where the Jews are being held. Kennedy courageously walks into the compartment where he is disdainfully met by the leading terrorists. The terrorist asks what his name is and Kennedy responds that his name is William O'Malley. Perplexed by the situation, the terrorist asks what the priest wants. He responds that since he is a Catholic priest and a follower of Jesus Christ, that he too is Jewish. If you take one, you have to take us all, answers the priest who willingly accompanies the Jewish hostages. And so my dear friends, on this fourth Sunday of the Easter season, we consider now Jesus as the Good Shepherd. The main part of the Holy Land was a large central plateau about 35 miles long. The ground was, for the most part, rough and rocky. It was possible for sheep just to stay in one, it was not possible for sheep to just to stay in one area for the grazing. Large areas for grazing simply did not exist. Every flock had to have a shepherd who led his flock every day to places where the sheep could eat. So the life of the shepherd was very difficult. A flock of sheep never gazed without his presence, and therefore the shepherd was on duty every day of the week. Since the sheep always had to travel in order to find grass to eat, they were never left alone. Sheep could get lost, or they could be attacked by wolves or stolen by robbers. Sheep then were seldom used for regular food by the people of the Holy Land. Rather, sheep then, they were cultivated for the use of their wool. So, in this way, the sheep were with the shepherd for a very long time. He gave each one of them a name, and they all knew his voice. In fact, it is said that each shepherd had a peculiar way of speaking to the sheep that allowed them to know that he was their shepherd. And so during the warm weather, it was common for the sheep to spend the night away from the village farm. The shepherd watched over them throughout the night. In these circumstances, the sheep stayed in open areas surrounded by a low rock wall. In these areas, the sheep entered and left through an open space which had no door or gate of any kind. So during the night, the shepherd would sleep stretched out within the empty space so that no sheep could get out except by crossing over his body. And the opening then was measured by how tall or short the shepherd was. At the same time, a wolf or robber could not get in except by crossing over his body as well. And so here we can see a prime example of how the shepherd would give his life for his sheep. So we hear in today's gospel passage on this fourth Sunday of Easter, Jesus is the good shepherd. What does this mean? It means that Jesus gives his life for us. This is another way of understanding Easter and what it means for Jesus on Good Friday to die on the cross for our salvation. The Easter season then is a continual celebration of this one central mystery of Christianity, that Jesus gave his life for us by dying on the cross. He saved us from our sins. We all know that at times getting directions from someone when we are lost can be a frustrating experience. In modern times we have GPS systems on our phones, but even sometimes those things go down and then we're in real trouble. And perhaps you scramble for a piece of paper to scribble a few indications like go right at the light and take your first left. Maybe the person who gives you the directions is wrong and instead of a right you should have taken a left. 
Sometimes you, cro- you come across a kind person who says, come and I'll take you there. In this case, the person is the way and so you can't go wrong. So Jesus then tells us in the Gospels that he is the way. Jesus does not give us advice and directions. He takes us by the hand and leads us to eternal life in heaven. He does not tell us about the way. He is the way. So this is why Christianity is essentially different from all other religions, because the Christian does not merely follow a series of rules and regulations, nor does he submit himself to a spiritual leader's indications of how to live certain principles, even austere principles. Christianity, then, is not about a what, but about a whom. And that's just what we are reminded of during this Easter season. Ultimately, Christianity is about relationship and, of course, the greatest relationship of all. Christianity is about a relationship with the best friend anyone could ever have. That is Jesus. Married couples, boyfriends and girlfriends, and even dear friends understand what a relationship is. True friendship is true personal love. True friendship is not based upon an arrangement of rules. Friendship goes much deeper than this. Friendship is a relationship. And so through the Easter mystery of baptism, we are incorporated into Christ. The life of sanctifying grace launches us into an awesome bond or friendship or communion with Jesus. And so our relationship with Jesus is personal. He is real because he is alive. The tomb is empty. He is a living person that sees us, that hears us, that speaks with us, and walks with us, and is with us as we struggle through daily life. He is there to bless us and to strengthen us. He is with us to sustain us and even to dry our tears. Jesus is always there because he has truly risen on Easter Sunday morning. And so our relationship with Jesus is real. Before his death on the cross, in the intimacy of the upper room where he imparted to his friends his last words before his passion and resurrection, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so love is not based upon empty words. And love is not wishful thinking. And love isn't translated into, you know, different traditions and customs like lighting candles. Lighting candles is fine. Having religious items in our house is fine. Blessing our homes with holy water is fine. But are we living the gospel? That's the key. When Jesus speaks to us in the gospels about humility, service, patience, chastity, honesty, apostolic zeal, and the other gospel virtues, he calls us to put these virtues into practice within the circumstances of our daily lives. We show Jesus our true love by doing gospel deeds. Our relationship is so personal that by living out the gospel, we then become transformed into Jesus, which is the goal of the Christian life. The imitation of Christ brings us to transformation. Authentic relationship automatically brings us to imitation and transformation. It's true, for example, married spouses that have been married perhaps for a long time. And their relationship is so, so profound that they don't even have to sometimes explain what the other one is thinking because they already know. That's where the two become one in many ways. Any true friendship then needs, needs to be nourished by relationship. When we spend a lot of time away from a friend, the friendship at times begins to die. You know, the old saying, out of sight, out of mind, is absolutely true. This is the struggle with family members living all over the country, with friends that, you know, move on to another part of the country. Sometimes, you know, it's hard to keep the relationship going. And so this is why in order to keep our relationship strong with Jesus, prayer, and the sacraments. This relationship needs to be nourished every day. Pope Francis wrote a number of years ago, thanks solely to this encounter or renewed encounter with God's love, which blossoms into an enriching friendship, 
we are liberated from our narrowness and self-absorption. We become fully human when we become more than human, when we let God bring us beyond ourselves in order to attain the fullest trust of our being. Prayer, meditation of the scriptures, the daily reception of the Eucharist or a visit to the Blessed Sacrament, time of adoration, the rosary, frequent confession, these are the preferred moments of intimacy with the risen Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. So what then are, or what would be then, the basic conclusion or practical application from today's gospel passage? Well, just as Jesus is the good shepherd for us, then we're going to imitate Jesus by being a good shepherd for everyone around us, and that's particularly in the family. Mother Teresa once famously said, if you want to save the world, go home and love your family. I used to think that was kind of simplistic, but then, you know, I think about it a lot, and she's right. What does that mean to go home and to love your family? It means to be that shepherd. Watch over your family. Watch over your husband and your wife. Watch over your children and grandchildren. Keep them from dangers. Help them to move forward in all aspects of life, whether it's with their education, their health, or their spiritual life. It's to be there, to watch. Those of you who are good parents and grandparents know what that is, and particularly in the times that we're living in, it's so important to watch over such issues like the internet, the phone, the television, movies. And when your kids are older, well, who are their friends? Where are they going? What are they doing? It takes a lot. It's not easy. And so we hear in today the prayers of today's Mass. The first prayer, it's called the opening prayer or the colic. We hear these words, Almighty and ever-living God, lead us to a share in the joys of heaven so that the humble flock may reach where the brave shepherd has gone before. And then after Holy Communion, the last prayer of the Mass is as follows. Look upon your flock, kind shepherd, and be pleased to settle in eternal pastures the sheep you have redeemed by the precious blood of your son. What does all this refer to, or how does it tie in? Well, it ties in very beautifully when we listen to today's second reading from the first letter of John, chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. And this then this part of scripture, this part of the Bible, is the scriptural reference for the beatific vision that we will see. This is where the definition of the fact that in heaven we will see God face to face comes from. St. John says, We do not know that when it is revealed we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is what's called the beatific vision, to see God face to face in heaven. And so, 1 John talks to us about the reality of heaven and what is called beatitude, seeing God for all eternity in heaven. So ultimately, really, the job of a mother and a father is, to, one, get to heaven, help your spouse get to heaven, and then get your children to heaven. Okay? My job, okay, and then assisted by the deacon, then is there's no other, you know, one thing is keep the church clean, you know, pay the bills, raise the money to pay the bills, you know, cut the grass, you know, whatever. But ultimately, the job of a priest, and of course, the job, the mission of the church is to get everybody to heaven. That's it. Anything outside of that is just secondary, whether it's breakfast or a festival or whatever. All those things are nice things, but the principal thing is that and that's what I, you know, I pray for you all day long and constantly. And when I wake up at night, sometimes worried, well, I pray for you. So it's a constant prayer for the conversion of our parishioners, for the sanctification of our parishioners, for the salvation of all the so that so that when we when our time is up here on this good earth, then we are all in heaven together. That's the key. That's the mission of the family. That's the mission of the church family. That's the mission of the church, to be a shepherd, a shepherdess. Sometimes, you know, we, we encourage, 
We, we motivate, we help, we console, we're there, all of us, just like a mom and a dad, a priest and a deacon, right? We're there to help one another, just like also children sometimes have to step in and help their parents or their grandparents in certain ways, particularly some families that suffer and deal with different situations today, right? Crisis situations of missing parents for whatever reason. So this, this, is, uh, this is just a nice little reminder of something that we all know, what our mission is. And of course, none of this is easy. It's very demanding. If we take this mission seriously, it's very demanding, particularly in the times that we live in today. And this is why then every day we need to be renewed and refreshed, being with the Good Shepherd Jesus through our life of prayer.